Professor Dr. Bill Cope uh, is the founder of Common Ground Research Networks, and he's been a comrade and uh, a colleague on the long journey to a range of knowledge communities with several of us across the world, and with us in particular with the Inclusive Museum Knowledge Community. Bill, we really appreciate your leadership, your generosity in supporting this Inclusive Museum Knowledge Community. And also with us is Tamsin Gilbert. Tamsin is a conference producer for the 13th International Conference on the Inclusive Museum. And uh, this is the plenary session. And the plenary session focusing on the theme, urban futures and historical urban landscapes. But to discuss this, we have a wonderful set of panelists. And you've all got the confirmation email with the outline of what this is all about. Um, we consider urbanism as a process, it's a dynamic process. So you have uh, uh, someone like uh, Joanna Souza Montiero, who is the director of the Museum of Lisbon, um, you know, dealing with the deep layers of heritage in Lisbon and Portugal, as well as Europe in general, you know, uh, in communicating, you know, uh, what does it mean in during the pandemic, in the post-pandemic situation to run uh, a, a city museum, if, if you will. But she's also the president of uh, the CAMO Committee of International Council of Museums, that is the International Committee for the Collections and Activities of the Museums of Cities. Now you can imagine that when we have a large number of people living in the cities around the world, the role that city museums play and how do we understand the contextuality of these city museums in terms of the urban landscapes. And uh, uh, then we have uh, Dr. Mario Mutino. Mario is actually one of these dream faculty members that we all want to have. He, he's an architect, he's an anthropologist. So there are not many people who are anthropologists of the built environment in the world. And he's one of the rare experts in this area. He's the rector and architect and senior researcher at the Luciform University of Humanities and Technologies in Lisbon. And then from my own institution, we have Associate Professor Dr. Ashima Sood, Anand National University. She has a PhD in economics from Cornell University. Ashima, every, every session like, one of the things that Common Ground Research Networks does is, you know, bring in the next generation. You know, in fact, we have, a lot of young people who chair, who host, who moderate. So here too in the plenary, Ashima is our youth voice and uh, she's a passionate advocate for urbanism as a process, but takes a particular approach based on the economic valuing you know, of urbanism. But first to kickstart the panel, we have Professor Dr. Uta Potkis here, who I was privileged to meet when I was uh, keynote speaker at her institution last year at the end of October, while well, she was the one who invited me. Thank you, Uta. She's with the Department of Architectural Engineering, remember Architectural Engineering and Technology, Delft University of Technology, Delft TU, one of the top three you know, uh, design universities in the world and in the Netherlands. So each of the panelists will speak for about you know, eight minutes, to addressing up to three points on the theme that you all got in the confirmation email. And then we're going to take questions. So please, you know, there are protocols in the chat room. So read the protocols, please respect the protocols. And uh, the second thing is that if you have any questions, please post them in the questions and answers box that is there. I have Shalvari who is going to collate them, click them across to me and I'm going to put them across to the panel. So that's the pro procedure, and I'm not going to do detailed introductions anymore. I just call on the people. I myself, uh, I'm a Salzburg Global Fellow. I'm the uh, chair of the, the Common Ground Research Network on the Inclusive Museum, and also editor of the journal, as uh, Professor Bill Cope mentioned. And I'm at the Anand National University, and uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to welcome you all from around the world. I think we have about 86 countries represented. That's wonderful. And especially we get uh, excellent participation from Africa. It means a lot to me having worked in Africa. 
So now we'll kick start on the theme with uh, Professor Dr. Uta Portges here. Uta, over to you. Let me un unmute myself. Yes, it has worked. Um, dear Amar, uh, dear Bill, thank you so much for this introduction and I have to say that I am uh, very excited. It's the first time for me to, um, to speak in, in, let's say, in this community and uh, um, I'm amazed of that how many participants from all over the world, I had a short look to the, to the chat, are participating. So Amar generously introduced me uh, with a double engineering and it's right. Uh, um, I'm placed as a share of heritage and technology uh, within the Department of Architectural Engineering and Technology at TU Delft. Um, but together with uh, my colleagues um, Anna Pereira Rodas and Vessel de Jonge, we are representing the section of heritage and architecture, uh, which is a, a little bit interesting, but which fits probably very nicely to also to this session. We are a kind of interdisciplinary team. Um, so the crossover in between architects and engineers is something that um, has always been to my interest. And I'm, I, am, um, I did my PhD myself in a civil engineering factory back in Germany after studying architecture. That's for your knowledge. And I, afterwards I was teaching an interior architects uh, now for more than 15 years. So I think that is important to mention that uh, we um, have to learn to um, think cross-disciplinary and it is important to experience different disciplines by yourself to get a kind of understanding um, of maybe different characters of different methods um, that are to be applied. But let me come uh, to the theme of today's conference. It's about historic urban landscapes and uh, urbanism as a process and also the role that museums um, um, may play in that. My um, talk will focus on, on one aspect and um, which will be modernity. And uh, that has to do with my, let's say, uh, second role or third role that I have. I'm also representing Docomomo. As you may know, it's a, a global organization also with more than 73 chapters worldwide, uh, actually hosted in Lisbon at the moment. Uh, that's a coincidence. We have two speakers from Lisbon. So Docomomo stands for Conservation Documentation of the Modern Movement. And I'm myself, I'm Vice Chair of Docomomo Germany, and I'm also um, sharing the Committee of Technology within Docomomo International. And um, coming back to the conference that Amar just mentioned, which was our kind of a kind of kickoff conference last year at TU Delft, which was on heritage and the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, in our closing uh, keynote, um, Randall Mason from uh, Philadelphia uh, put something a little bit provocative when he said, modernity creates problem and uh, it categorizes, it puts everything into boxes and it is not really um, aiming at a holistic approach. Um, of course, this was a provocation. Um, looking back um, uh, to the historic urban landscapes of the 20th century and of those of the beginning 21st centuries, which is already a 20 years now, where we have also seen um, rapid and, and dramatic developments. So um, let's put this and, uh, as, as a kind of starting point for the three points I'm going to address. Um, modernity creates problems. Um, I think maybe the biggest problem is the speed that we are confronted with uh, the last 120 years um, compared to the historic urban landscapes that have developed before and that challenges us in um, understanding and in rather predicting and not having time to look back. What Docomomo does is of course looking back and um, when it started uh, 1980 and the 1980s in the Netherlands, um, the colleagues did exactly that. They looked back to the beginning of the 20th century and tried to understand what was driving the um, urban um, uh, and social processes and they discovered that actually architects at that point were very much concerned with societal questions, with health and well-being of the, the citizens by creating um, a new part or a new kind of um, yeah, social housing but in general improvements um, in housing situations. 
And um, after this organization uh, developed uh, with the 73 chapters that there are worldwide now, there is a notion of that this kind of uh, modernity is perceived very differently in each continent, maybe in each country. And uh, today we are speaking about multiple modernities, and that is a term that I would like to stress. We cannot, we cannot um, just um, work with one definition, and uh, there is, of course, always this kind of complaint or concern that this view of modernity is a European, a Eurocentric um, approach. So what I would like to um, address is really to, for you um, who are active, um, to reach out to understand what is the modernity of your city, of your place, of your country or of your continent, um, of your region. And uh, probably there for sure there is not one answer to this. And it was just mentioned in the introduction today, what is normal? We can, we can uh, looking uh, to corona and the pandemic, and somehow we are all expecting that this may change our behavior, our look to the world. Um, but I think we have to live with uh, um, a diversity, which is very, challenges, very challenging. So defining modernity and multiple modernities, which means also to define different historic urban landscapes. Um, that would be my first, um, maybe, um, uh, lesson or point to mention. Then, coming back to um, the introduction of saying about modernity has started to categorize everything, to break it down in little pieces, and we forgot maybe about the holistic approach, about um, looking at different categories and balancing things, because um, that might be a kind of modern scientific approach which uh, always forces us to be very precise and to look into little details. And um, what um, I would like to um, address is that we understand and that we learn and find and define methods to come back to this holistic approach. And that is something that really keeps us busy and is one of our ambitions in Delft to collaborate, first of us, the three of us, together with our colleagues in the Department of Engineering and in Urbanism and in Architecture, to make these cross links, to create feasible, and that's important, feasible and maybe simple methods that can, um, that can support this holistic approach for the diverse modernities and uh, concepts of historic urban landscape. And... Um, this means um, also, if I talk about multiple modernities, that probably this is not just one method and not one approach, but that we have to accept that there might be different methods and approaches. And this is often critically seen within the scientific approaches where we hope to have validated methods um, and uh, which often also um, forms a kind of clash of the disciplines when it comes to engineers that often follow a very systematic and quantitative approach. And on the other hand, when we talk about social scientists that rather follow a qualitative approach. So this is my um, mm, speech to, um, to um, encourage you um, to follow this uh, a combination of different methods by looking at multiple modernities, exploring multiple modernities, and to come up with a holistic approach which uh, somehow is incorporated into the idea of historic urban landscapes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Portgis here. Thank you, Uta. Very much appreciated. Multiple modernities. Modernity has fragmented us, but how do we come back to a holistic you know, approach. Now how do how do you? I mean, how does Joanna, as the director of Museum of Lisbon, deal with modernity? I mean, she's got fantastic collections. I've been to that museum some time ago, mm -hmm. and uh, she has amazing programs. But in terms of the experience, she brings people together. Joanna, over to you. Thank you so much, Amar. Um, 
So uh, first, I would like to thank you, Professor Margala. Uh, it is a very, very nice to be in such a promising webinar, and it's, uh, and it's a pleasure to work with uh, the Inclusive Museum organization. We will host next year um, the um, physical conference of the Inclusive Museum, also with the Universidad Lusofuna partnership with, with the Professor Mario Motinho. So uh, thank you for this opportunity. I would like to address uh, very briefly so the three points. First, it would be about what city museums are nowadays, which, because they are transforming into something very different from uh, the last uh, 50 years or so. And then I uh, would like to explain how, um, as uh, Professor Amar just um, addressed, um, how the, our Museum of Lisbon is uh, trying to um, respond to the outbreak uh, pandemic. And um, the third will be um, what is um, very briefly our ICOM community International Committee of International uh, mu City Museums, and what are we doing uh, right now? Just a, one, one or two uh, ideas that we uh, at least, yes, we, we and, and I also consider more relevant now. So uh, what about city museums? Um, along with the idea and, um, and, and the reality of cities themselves that are, of course, changing very, very rapidly, and um, as everybody knows, uh, cities are concentrating the majority of the world population, which is something that has very, very serious consequences in all senses, positives and not so positives, and, and places uh, very, very important challenges for uh, everyday life. And along with this process, not only the megalopolis, but the urban change in general, cities, uh, museums are responding uh, uh, to, to it. And so there is a movement of change in city museums. Um, first, let me speak about the change of old city museums, like uh, our Museum of Lisbon. And there are well, older city museums, uh, mainly in, across Europe and North America, and also some in South America. They are, um, for the last 20 years or so, they are transforming themselves a lot, changing even their mission statements, but also the collections they, they are um, gathering into more contemporary items and not only concerned with the past history. They are changing their permanent uh, exhibitions uh, in changing um, the way the story, the past history of, of the, their cities is told, embracing transversal issues that are, of course, um, at um, the day, uh, daily life of any museum or a lot of museums in the world regarding uh, decolonization, um, social, uh, social rights, equality, and um, migration movements and of course many uh, and sustainability uh, amongst other uh, transversal themes but in our case in the city museums case we are also very much concerned um, to um, make the story told um, not stop in the like 50 years ago or even a hundred years ago and make the story come to the, the today's life because um, uh, as the cities are changing so rapidly, the museums, of course, we cannot um, just take pictures every day to what's happening every day in cities, but we should uh, be more and more aware of what's happening in changing also the cultures of the city and the languages of the cities and the food of the cities and every way the life is happening in cities. And so um, museums are, embracing new themes, new ways to exhibit, and new, new topics to be exhibited that have to be to, to do with everyday life. And also act more and more uh, relevant, in a more and more relevant way to the cities, city residents, including um, migrants, of course, regardless of, of nationalities and origin, geographical origins. Um, and maybe, at least in our case, we are not so much concerned with tourists, and they are more concerned, concerned with um, the diversity of the residents. Um, whilst um, there are many, many city museums in the world, 
um, fewer in Africa, but uh, they are growing, but lots of them in Asia and North and South America and also New Zealand and, and Australia, and of course in Europe, across the whole Europe, are changing. There are also lots of them being created from scratch as new museums. Um, so we have city museums that are created, they are more, more close to urban study centers, and so more close to architects and urban specialists and other there are more like apparently traditional museums with collections and research and documentation and everything but also um, embracing and enhancing um, research on very relevant topics for today's life in cities the second uh, topic would be about uh, our museum of lisbon the our museum is uh, very old but it opened um, in our uh, main venue in the late 70s. And we are, like so many others in the world, changing, transforming completely the permanent exhibition and the way the story of, um, which is, it is a very, very long story because Lisbon as a city has 2000 years, um, but we are changing the way the story is being told. And we are especially very active in making temporary exhibitions about both historic and traditional themes more related to the communi communication of our very uh, important um, collections of styles, archaeology, uh, historical painting, and so forth. Um, but also um, very concerned about researching and exhibiting themes like the light of Lisbon, um, the history of the city from the pavement's uh, perspective, um, many uh, consequences about the urban growth in the urbanism itself, and um, many others. Uh, one of the, our uh, uh, um, concerns right now is about sustainability and we are working on uh, one very big research project for uh, three years almost four now we are opening next month an exhibition about the history and the present age of um, the vegetable gardens in lisbon since the middle age up to uh, today or even tomorrow's uh, age of vegetable gardens relating um, food security, um, of course, uh, urban sustainability relation between the nature growth and the growth of the urban constructions and how people, nature and um, the constructions can live together, can better live together. And uh, we are also addressing very much directly in this uh, project and exhibition and book um, some um, important stories of immigrants that work, uh, that live and work in Lisbon for many different reasons and that grow um, very different vegetables which create very different cultures in our daily life. About the COVID-19 uh, outbreak, the museum, like of course, well, plenty of other museums across the world, we tried to um, enhance our digital being and we didn't a week after the emergency state was declared and we had to close the museum which was something very cruel to do uh, we uh, were uh, able to um, create and deliver every single day different digital contents on facebook and also uh, Instagram and some of them on our um, youtube channel and we created uh, specific con contents trying to connect um, in an in a, um, empathic way our collections. And we started with a, a tour, a very simple tour made um, in uh, our storages, our central storages, connecting our um, uh, life of inner life with the inner life of the people that had to be stuck at home with this uh, very big problem. And we started to uh, create uh, videos and um, uh, narrations of uh, images of our collections and also learning uh, contents specifically uh, addressing the families that were at home. And so for um, four months, the two months of the emergency state and the first two months of the slow open 
open up again to the well uh, to the public. We had um, over 400,000 views of digital contents, which for us was very interesting to get. And we will we are trying to learn from that um, results and um, stay as relevant in the digital context as on offline content. And after that, in July, in late July, we opened an exhibition uh, called Still Lisbon, this is the brochure of it, um, that um, resulted from asking for photojournalists um, for their um, photos of a very uh, of totally or almost totally empty uh, city. And the city is a big city with lots of people and like in all, all over uh, the world, uh, suddenly it became with a part of its soul just gone uh, because no one was there. And so we, we had um, a very, very uh, quick but very, very nice and fruitful work with this uh, photojournalist and the curator. And uh, the, this exhibition is, is really interesting uh, to lots of, uh, of people that are some of them seeing a very beautiful city because it's not visually polluted with cars and, and transportations and people, but also uh, for many, maybe to the majority of people, it's a, a, a very um, uh, like a solidarity distress, uh, um, feeling of distress um, between people who are living there and feeling the impact of the sudden emptiness and those who photographed it and, and displayed it with uh, some poetic, uh, we think, um, inland. And uh, finally, uh, my third point, it's about CAMAC. CAMAC is one of the 30 international committees of ICOM, which is the International Council of Museums. We have now about 600 uh, members across the five continents. Um, and our members are mainly professional, work, professional uh, people working in city museums, but also urban experts and architects and people that study and work with urban sustainability. We have online and all um, uh, at your disposal uh, seven uh, books and 11 issues of our review, which uh, growth from, from the previous uh, newsletter, and we still have there uh, also online 22 issues of the newsletter. There is plenty of food for thought in these publications, online publications, all digital and free to down download. Um, the committee tries to and, 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 and can ref, do, do reflect um, upon the growing focus worldwide on cities about their uh, economic importance, the spectacular growth and the problems and possibilities that spectacular growth present. Uh, the matters of debate regarding cities are most, almost endless since well, pollution, regeneration, urban regeneration, uh, cars and public transportation, the suburbs, the destruction of heritage, and all kinds of challenges uh, coming from the migration movements. We had a special project for um, over three years only about migration and cities, which was really, really interesting for all of us. We are uh, setting up an on online uh, a, a webinar on the 7th of October, only focused on the response uh, for uh, the COVID response from city museums and, um, and uh, cities themselves. Um, we are now working on, uh, for well, five years, four years, working on um, city museums concepts and definition and definitions, reworking on it, gathering ideas, and we are starting a um, uh, international partnership with partners from uh, Taiwan, uh, the Netherlands, and um, Asia Pacific, South Africa, and Argentina, among uh, uh, other, other places, a project that will hopefully in three years end up on delivering a book and an online um, content, group of contents regarding the mapping 
uh, in the world of uh, city museums nowadays, which Thank you, Joanna. we don't have yet. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you. I mean, it's uh, bringing museums, making them relevant in the urban landscapes uh, across the world. And there are many members of CAMOC that are listening to, so welcome to CAMOC members. Um, thank you. Now, we move on to Mario, Rector Mario. Mario is uh, an architect and anthropologist. You know, you, we started off with uh, an engineer and uh, architect, and, and now we move on to Mario. Mario, you, you advocate, you're one of the pioneers in dealing uh, with socio-museology. Could we hand over to you now to reflect? Yeah. Okay, well, first of all, thank you, Amar, for the possibility you gave me to share uh, some ideas, I believe, and a lot of doubts that I have uh, when we talk about these uh, trends of uh, museology. Well, uh, I prepare something written because I don't want to go more than my eight minutes. So let me read uh, and uh, it will be better. Well, uh, I believe this uh, webinar takes place in times of insecurity, uh, but also uh, improve enrichment. Times of insecurity, as no one knows what our life will be in the coming weeks, months, or even years. Times of impoverishment in an economic system centered on the accumulation of health and the so consequent exclusion of most of the world population. Times of xenophobia, racism, obscurantism enter the parliaments of so many countries and cities sometimes and in cities sometimes anger and revolt take up the streets but this is the time we live on and it will be the understanding of our world that will make us face the social issues and if the recognition of the impoverishment is necessary for us to live in our time it is also necessary to give meaning to the place that we intend to occupy as citizens in our relationships, in our jobs, in our universities, in our museums. Let us share how Alma Whitlin in the post-World War II described his idea of museums. She said, museums are man-made institutions in the service of men. They are not ends in themselves. What can museums do? with regard to the unmet needs of people. And I will repeat uh, often this idea, unmet, unmet needs of people. Museums are not islands in space, she said. They have to be considered in the context of the life outside their walls. When Alma Whitlin talks about the unmet needs of people, she is actually pointing out that the place of museums will be to look to present daily challenge. It took years for the social dimension of museology to be recognized. There were years of affirmation of innovative, sensible, militant museology. But nowadays, this process has a growing global expression. They highlight the social responsibility of museums as factor of development. This new reality has had a significant impact on the academic and professional environment, revealing itself in the increase of national and international scientific meetings, as well as the increase of underground master and doctoral higher education in many countries, and the consequent production of dissertation, theses, postdoctorates, as a result of a more consistent scientific research. These museums that deal with the unmet needs of people more and more have an expression in the so-called social museology, and particularly in what we can want to call insurgent museology. This museum's approach was recognized in the final document of the MINOM uh, ICOM, Affiliated Organization to ICOM, which took place in Rio in 2013 in defense of a museology aiming to, to understand the, the understanding of community museums as a political, poetical, and pedagogical process in permanent construction and linked to the very specific worldviews. And recognizing that the organization give and take, and take these organizations give and take, make and unmake their memories feelings, ideas, dreams, fears, 
and live their own reality without asking permission to establish authorities. But the rationality of this change in museology did not occur alone within museology itself. On the contrary, they express profound change that have occurred in the field of social science as a whole. In the last decades, particularly relevant since the 80s, the social science have been facing profound transformations. We are thinking about the emergence of the public dimension of sociology, anthropology, history, the public dimension of philosophy, among others. After a long period of struggle for recognition within the social science, these public schools of thought are now recognized for the contribution they have made, the theoretical approach, and as a strategy for fi to find solution solutions. In result of the same process, we can say that museology with social responsibility has been recognized as part of social sciences and assumed as a public museology known as school of thought, which today we can call socio-museology. And this socio-museology making appeal to the broadest interdisciplinarity, we can say holistic view, as I've been proposed in the beginning of this webinar, seeks exactly to contribute to the clarification of the concepts generated in the innovative museological practice. Practice assuming the social museology, community museology, indigenous and native museology, LGBTQ, high plus museology, eco museology, critical museology, among others. In all cases, a community dimension is present. The recognition of the primacy of dialogical processes are present too. The involvement with social, environment, and sustainable issues are also present. In other words, we live a time where the unmet needs of people mentioned by Alma with Lynn, as well as the proposals highlighted by the Round Table of Santiago, or more recently by UNESCO recommendations in 2015, become tools for the museums. In consequence, social museology is not a new term for the new museology. It should be instead understood as a public museology based in a systemic interdisciplinarity with other areas of knowledge doing and thinking the new trends of museology as a resource for sustainable development of mankind. The starting point for socio-museology <coughs> seems to be rather distant in time, but if we consider its epistemological roots, it is impossible to sustain socio-museology without also reclaiming the same resources and the same reference as other public social sciences. In the, this is most evident when we have to support and reference Paul Frey, Franz Fanon, Gramsci, Habermas, for example. In other cases, it is also hard to think socio-museology without Marx, Weber, Durkheim, whose contributions continue to support more consistent understanding of contemporary society. It is hard to not consider the thinking of a host of researchers and museologists who have contributed in particular, particular since in the 70s to the knowledge in the fields of museology in general, such as Georges-Henri Rivière, uh, Pero Nukrin, Hugues de Varin, Stransky, Gregorova, Peter Van Mensch, Marta Jona, Sharon McDonald, Sofka, uh, Mario Chagas, Cristina Bruno, Bernardo Loch, Richard Sandwell, Pierre Mera, just to name a few. For us, sociomuseology represents the possibility of looking at the complex reality of museums with social responsibility in its diversity of concepts and priorities, but also trying to understand their relationship with other museums' concepts, priorities that are the result of other political and social contexts. For us, and I'm going to finish, sociomuseology also represents the possibility of understanding new rationalities, of building new professional and academic curricula for our universities, new partnerships for a more respectful, full world and cognitive justice. Sociomuseology can be the link that enhances museology's place based on the need to promote critical thinking about contemporary world. And for us, 
It will be this critical thing that will allow us to understand urban futures and historical urban landscapes as an aspect of the impoverishment of humanity in the present times. And that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mario. Thank you. That's wonderful. Uh, the way we've, uh, you, you brought in dialogical, plurilogical, if you will, from monological uh, yeah. to interdisciplinary and putting people in the center, which means people and the issues, contemporary issues in the center being relevant. Uh, wonderful, so eloquently spoken, Mario. Thank you so much. Now move, we move on to the last panelist, but before we move on to the last panelist, so since we have a very eminent scholar and a very eminent educationalist among us, Professor Bill Koch. Bill, if you could think about it after we finish the five with, with uh, Professor Ashi Masood, if you could briefly tell us, you know, you're the world's leading expert on blended learning, inclusive pedagogy, if you could give some reflections as to where we're we going in terms of blended learning, inclusive pedagogy. If you could think about it, Bill, we would really appreciate it. Very short, we don't want to take up too much of your time. Now over to Professor yeah, Ashima. Yeah, Professor Ashima Sooth. Thank you so much, Professor Gala, for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, I've really enjoyed listening to the panelists today, and I'm really glad to be here. As I participate uh, from Anand Pasha University today in Ahmedabad, there are two thematics that I wanted to address. I think first, what does inclusion and sustainability mean in the immediate and in the long-term future? And second, what are the pathways for the future to safeguard grassroots cultural and linguistic diversity? Both of these imperatives are really coming together, as I see it, in the informal cities of the global south. Let me situate what I am going to say in some numbers first. In 2014, 54% uh, of the world's population was urban. By 2050, it's expected that more than two thirds of the world's population will be urban. Three countries of the global south, that is India, China, and Nigeria, will house 35% of this projected growth. So our future is urban and it is located largely in the global south. First, I want to argue today that this urban future is also informal. One eighth of the world's population lives in slums, though that is by no means the only measure of urban informality. By another metric, as much as 82% of urban workers in South Asia and about two thirds in Sub-Saharan Africa are informally employed. What do we mean by the informal? I mean, we are talking about habitats, we are talking about employment, so what do we mean by the informal? This is a term that is actually endlessly contested. Very simply, we can understand it in contrast to the formal, that which is planned, regulated, tended, and supported by the state. The informal city, on the other hand, is in some ways wild. It is resistant to law and regulation. It is sometimes benignly but sometimes also malignly neglected by the state apparatus. Close your eyes for a moment and think of Dharvi in Mumbai, think of Kalbira in Nairobi, or think of the favelas of Rio de Janeiro. Now, this informal city has typically been seen as a hotbed of urban problems. Whether you think of congestion, whether you think of poor provisioning of public services, water access or sanitation. When it comes to healthcare, it evokes high mobility, morbidity, and mortality. It stands for economic and social disparity. If the former city is a kind of a garden, then the informal city is the weed. And in fact, policymakers in many countries in many cities around the world have responded to it by trying to weed it out. But what I want to argue today is that the informal city is the future of our urbanizing world. But more importantly, it is also the custodian of a vast repository of urban intangible and tangible heritage. This tangible heritage that I'm speaking about includes the remarkable diversity of built form in the slums of Ahmedabad or Lima or Johannesburg. It includes the skills and the crafts and the talents that are unique to this informal economy. Think about the circuits of e-waste disassembly or processing in cities like Bangalore. Think about the remarkable artisanal trades of Banaras, weavers, woodworkers, metal workers, masteries. 
in my own work i have documented the legacy for example of community kirtan um devotional mu musical form that is really unique to informal uh, communities and particularly informs the life of its female participants in working class south delhi the very form and aesthetic of kirtan uh, as professor motino was pointing out uh, you know it really depends on that call response dialogic logic between participants there is a lot of work to be done in documenting and where appropriate supporting these knowledge systems and practices the speakers before me have spoken about the role of uh, social museology in preserving urban heritage and indeed in india there are many private and community museums that are doing this work for example in delhi there is the center for community knowledge at ambedkar university which celebrates neighborhood museums even though it's not necessarily through the lens of the urban and formal this intangible heritage also encompasses the wealth of unspoken practices and tacit knowledges you know all of the legal and technical work arounds that we know as jugad and this is incidentally a hindi word that has now entered the oxford english dictionary in my own field of urban studies a variety of scholars have investigated grassroots practices of occupancy by which claims are actually made in the informal city now jugad or occupancy are by no means really innocuous or harm free practices but as i have discovered in my own work on the cycle rickshaw market informality is necessitated by a legal system that refuses to afford recognition to such livelihoods and forms of exchange globally and there are a lot of definitional wrinkles here some estimates suggest that these bazaar economies could add up to a gdp of about 10 trillion dollars annually and that is a really fast growing number when it comes to the future however the informal system city seems to be even more problematic to policy make so think of the narrow lanes of dharavi and the social distancing that is required in this or future pandemics immediately becomes a nightmare this is even more the case when it came comes to climate change adaptation what would retrofitting of energy systems in an unauthorized colony look like the range of green building rating and certification programs so far if i didn't think of lead or the indian green building council have had little to say about such settlements yet it is in the slums and in the settlements in the economy of the informal city that the sustainable development goal of cities and communities must be realized this is an agenda that really needs to be front and center both in policy and pedagogy um i want to end today on a little bit of a hopeful note by uh, sharing the example of work that has been done in our own masters in urban design program at an national university After learning about informal systems one of our students documented the informal waste management practices in his own settlement another went further and designed a street landscape that made space for urban agriculture and for street vendors to participate in the busy life of a major intersection in Ahmedabad elsewhere at Anand University and Anand fellows have worked closely with urban informal communities on themes as diverse as covid era livelihoods as well as parental involvement in schools whether you think of the breadth and the sheer scale or the depth of lived experience the so called shadow or informal city guards both both the past heritage and the future promise of the world cities it demands really from all of us new forms of practice informed research and research informed practice for a more inclusive and sustainable future and that's my contention thank you so much Thank you, Professor Sood. That's wonderful. I think in many ways uh, you brought everything together from the perspective of the next generation. And I know that one of our uh, 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 participants is asking about Hull. Uh, those of you are not familiar with it, Hull is historical urban landscapes. Are, uh, it's a soft law instrument of UNESCO from 2011, and uh, Joanne already mentioned. Uh, about 2015 museum recommendation of unesco these are two soft law instruments and uh, in fact the the conference the 13th international conference on the inclusive museum is being organized in lisbon simply because we want to look at the intersectionality uh, international intersectionality of the two uh, soft law instruments of unesco both hall and the museum recommendation so but we don't want to talk about 
just the instruments so that people don't think we are dealing with compliance, but we are dealing with practice, theory and practice, and that's what we are doing uh, in this conference session. Now, before we move on to questions, I've already requested Professor Bill Cope. Um, we are the post pandemic first of all, uh, we will be moving into, you know, we are already moving into a blended situation. A blended situation requires translation of our curricula in terms of training, in terms of museum education, online, but also face to face, and requires a different kind of more sophisticated uh, pedagogy. Uh, Professor Bilko, with all your knowledge, could you make some re uh, reflections, please? Thank you. Yes, I mean, one of the things this pandemic has done, exactly what you're saying there, Amar, it's actually um, forced us to go online with a lot of things. We haven't had any alternative um, to do that. And one of the questions that I'm asking is what will, uh, exactly the question you're asking, in fact, which is what will be the lasting effects of that and what we can do. Now, one of the problems, the starting point, we've been forced to go online with tools which are really fraught. So one set of tools is Instagram and Facebook and um, the, you know, these American-owned things, by the way. I'm, I'm in the US at the moment, but I'm an Australian citizen, um, which are deeply problematic in terms of the space they give you to present something, um, but also the, the fact that they control the feed, they control, you know, you can put a post out and you've got a thousand members in your group and, and, and 50 people see it. Um, and, the, and so their agendas are essentially advertising agendas. So one of our questions has been vis-a-vis um, -vis social media, how do you control, how do you take control of social media? And what we've been building um, uh, with Scholar and, and folks who have been part of the research network are in Scholar, it's free to open an account, it's free to use the community area in Scholar, is building something where you own your own content. So when you, you, know, you put stuff on Facebook, you've actually given it to Facebook and then they make money out of prioritising um, uh, your work in a feed. And if it's not going to make money for them for advertising and it's not relevant, you, you get virtually no hits. It's inscrutable. So we've built a transparent activity stream feed, which is replicated on social media, but each post is not the length of a tweet or not the length of a Facebook post. Each post can be like a blog post. So you're, everybody's welcome to use that. Um, Common Grounds are not for profit. Um, um, some parts of it we need to be able to get revenue to work. So we have AI based analytics in there as well, where um, you know, we need to try and earn some money to pay people's, people's salaries essentially. But large parts of it are free, but it doesn't involve the manipulative, the manipulation of feeds and you own the content. But also what we do is we double this platform as uh, an e-learning platform. So what we want to do is we want this to be highly social, highly interactive. So one of the lessons of social media is that we've gone from these horizontal knowledge flows or, or kind of hub and spoke knowledge flows where, you know, I, I read a newspaper and there's no, there's precious little any connection with other people who are readers. So one of the things social media does, it builds horizontal community. Well, we, we want to do that in classrooms. So what we're doing is in the learning environment, uh, we're building these horizontal communities, um, but also communities where people can use not just word files to produce what they do or PDFs, but multimodal um, texts, which are collaboratively constructed around peer review and, and all that kind of stuff. Now we model that with the common ground communities, but in a sense, um, I want to go to a second set of digital tools. So I spoke about social media. Now I'm going to speak about e-learning systems. E-learning systems are all old hub and spoke file shuffling systems. You know, whether it's Coursera or Blackboard or any of these things, they are not collaborative spaces. They're not multimodal spaces. They're spaces where the teacher uploads a video and someone watches it. Now, you know, that, they are deeply problematic as well. So what we've been working on is trying to build a next generation of e-learning environments, which is this environment called Scholar. And I work at the University of Illinois. I've been, you know, we've been, we, my team has been lucky enough to get some quite large grants to build this over a number of years. Um, um, and our intents are absolutely social, absolutely political, to hand the ownership of content back to content creators and allow them to be in control of those feeds. Now, what we do is we post everything in Facebook, but there's always a link back to Scholar right? Which is we want the real action to happen in a, in a place where we control. We're happy to make things as visible as Facebook and Instagram and whatever uh, and Twitter allow us to make them, which is not very 
in fact, but bring people back into a space where we're in control. So that's a quick um, introduction to what we're doing. What I'm going to do is, um, uh, if people are interested, I am going to paste into the, uh, the chat box a link which is a description of Scholar from an e-learning point of view. Um, I'm also going to put a link in there. We have a blog where we keep talking about this um, stuff as well. Um, that's the second link. And um, in a moment, I'll put in a third link, which is that we have been common ground, something we call the Common Ground Media Lab, where we're trying to innovate and build these next generation of, um, we call these social knowledge technologies, not social media, social knowledge, where people are collaboratively working with each other um, to build uh, academic knowledge, cultural heritage, whatever. So that's a quick intro. Thank you, Amar. I didn't, I wasn't expecting oh, you to invite me to do that. Great. That's great. And all of you who are listening, and this is being recorded, so it'll be shared far, you know, widely beyond this uh, session, is that uh, the blog that Professor Bill Cope talked about, I'm a regular reader. I read everything that's posted on that blog because I find that it's way ahead of some of the discussion that's taking place online. And it's the most educational tool that I have, you know, I look forward to every time there's a post. Uh, I really appreciate it. But I have one question before we take, we have a small number of questions. I have one question for you. You mentioned about horizontal, you know, the spread, you know. Uh, but we in museums and we in uh, history circles, we're dealing with architecture, heritage, design, one thing, one malady we all suffer from is cultural amnesia. So how do you build that, you know, horizontal, but how do you go deep, you know, sort of in the right. So the word that I use is a kind of an architectural word, Murray, you might like this, which is the word scaffolds. So what we do is we build these scaffolds um, uh, where we might, let, let's say in a museum context, we might post something which is an artifact in the museum and get people to talk about it. But what we might also do is ask people, well, you put something in this virtual museum yourself, you find an example of something which is in your life, in your community, in your experience. And yes, we'll be, we'll be lightweight um, curators of this object, but you post the object. So what we have in the posting area in Scholar is the ability to write around the video, to put in um, media objects of all kinds. So, and, but we're expecting these will be kind of substantial things. So the idea behind this, if it's a learning environment, it's the co-design of the curriculum. If it's a museum, it's the co-design of the museum. So we will not just post our, um, you know, the stuff that we're delivering to you as curators, we will get you to contribute items to this museum um, as well. And by the way, we can, you know, anything inappropriate, we can remove it, we can edit it, we can modify it, we can, ask you to modify it, but then it builds a kind of a horizontal dialogical relationship. So what we're, what we're on about is whether it's learning or whether it's these other um, cultural spaces, we're on about building these dialogical communities, not monological transmission, we're transmitting culture to you, but dialogical, well, yes, we will transmit things to you, but you're also able to uh, contribute and translate things back. And so the key word we use both for education and other social sites is co-design. So what we do is we're going to enlist you as co-designers in the space, not just as passive recipients of what happens in the space, but we're going to actually entrust you to be co-designers. And if you break that trust, we'll, we'll, we'll edit it, we'll delete it, we'll do something. But nevertheless, we're going to, um, we're going to start from a moment of trust. Thank you, Professor Cope. One, one reflection, you use the word co-design. Uh, one of the most popular things right now in Europe, in fact, it's very sexy, everybody likes to say it, is co-design, co-curate, co-create. These are yep. the three terms that they're using all the time. But the kind of criticism that's coming is people are still doing the same thing, but there's still that us and them binary very much, you know, something that modernity created that Uta was talking about. Is it possible as we move towards meeting in Brisbane next year that we explore this, you know, co-design, co-create, co-curate, uh, doing a survey with our participants who are registered, who future will be registering, and uh, and create an online forum, you know, just before the conference in Lisbon next year, and and also throughout the conference engage 
people with the notion of co-create, co-design, co-curate? Is it possible? Yeah, of course. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, and also, by the way, the, the common ground tools, um, I'm not sure whether all 121 have accounts. You can create an account for free. And a lot, of, almost all of that I, what I spoke about is available at no charge. And you can build communities yourself within that space. Okay. So we have about, uh, I might say, just give a sense of the scale, but we have about 250,000 accounts in there at the moment. Um, um, and our aim is to be um, not Facebook, not Instagram, not Twitter, uh, better, better in all of those without the advertising, without the manipulation, without the, uh, the control by somebody else. So that's what our philosophy is. So anybody, please go and form an account. The links I sent you there, the link into the learning, um, new learning community, um, um, you can see it, it's visible, but if you'd like to join it, go and create an account and join us. Thank you, Professor Cope. That's really encouraging because an issue that comes up in museums is the ethics of engagement. The kind of transference you talked about is going to be highly respected and I think that we all look forward to um, next year in Lisbon, how we can collaborate, how can, you know, it's about what you used to talk about when we were all in Australia, collaborative learning and teaching, yeah. right? It's a, it's a, uh, so much of by the way it's also, it's also about diversity it's about a fa every possible voice being there and one of the arguments is look i've got a little formula a social science formula which is as soon as you leave space for agency diversity appears right right so in other words if you give people agency the people coming to the the virtual the real museum the minute you give them agency there's this incredibly rich diversity right that without agency, the diversity is not visible. You know, it's, it's what I call an architecture of sameness, right? But the minute you actually hand over some agency, you have diversity, it's inevitable. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Rizuko, agency. That's what Joanna was talking about, is the diversity that she's dealing with, how she's trying to engage with. And one of the things in Europe, again, is once agency is given, once it's plurilogical, you know, from monological to dialogical to plurilogical, the whole question of atmosphere, I'm not talking about ambience, but atmosphere, theories of atmosphere are being debated. How do we all collaboratively create the atmosphere uh, in that experiential space, both in the museums and the outreach, in reach of the museums, how do we do that? So let's follow up this, uh, we'll, we'll follow up this, very targeted, we'll do a survey with all our participants and build it up towards Lisbon next year. Those of you are listening, if you're not registered for the, uh, the, uh, the International Conference on the Inclusive Museum, just on museums, plural, on museums.com or .org, you'll go there, you'll go to the site. It's as simple as that. Uh, Bill, if you could post it in the, uh, in the chat box. Uh, now, coming to the questions, uh, somebody, I'll, I'll go from the bottom because somebody asks, wants to know more about sociomuseology. My strong recommendation is that it's such an exciting and amazing area. Just Google sociomuseology or just Google Professor Mario's name or Google my name and uh, you'll get a lot of sociomuseology stuff, publications dealing with under the title of eco museums. Okay. So, uh, so please do that, all of you, you know, and whoever asks a question. Now here is one from a young person. So I hope all the panelists are listening. As we are talking about the history of, of, of our urban landscape, but as in we see that in today's generation, the history about design and architecture is lost. So how can we as students and part of today's generation, and we be going to be the future of the of, of our world, make a change about this thinking. So, Uta, I'm going to look at you, you know, sort of to answer this question to kickstart. Could you, do you want me to read it again, Uta? I have to unmute. Uh, yeah, thank you. I was already reading this uh, question in the chat and uh, um, I'm not sure if, if there is just one answer, but probably multiple answers. So first of all, let me question uh, the, the note that, uh, or not question, but maybe discuss. It would be interesting if the, the one who asked the question may, may answer again in the chat so that we get, we'll get a feedback. 
um, I would very much appreciate. So if I understand correctly, the notion is to say that the young generation has lost the knowledge on the history of design and, and architecture, which, um, which uh, well, which uh, I may doubt. I mean, uh, I guess many are, you experience it um, everywhere. So it's uh, something that uh, is not just something that is educated in universities uh, to architects, um, but that is something that everybody um, can experience. And uh, what we just heard, I was uh, quite impressed of what Bill was telling about the Common Grounds uh, platform. Um, uh, knowledge is available everywhere. So it is rather that we have to learn um, to observe and, and to go in it. And coming back maybe to what, uh, speaking about Dokomomo, it was exactly that. At that time when it was founded, my colleague Vessel um, was a young student and they started to see these abandoned buildings and they started to question themselves. Um, what is it about? Why they are there? Why are they abandoned? Um, so I think it's a training, of course, of, uh, of all of us to, to be aware and uh, to observe and, and to question ourselves, um, which may already be a part of the answer to the question, what can we do with the young generation? Um, so, Amar, you just uh, gave uh, so many links of where knowledge uh, is available about eco-museums and socio-museology. And, um, uh, even if if we are critical as, as scientists um, um, about uh, um, op um, open source platforms, but nevertheless, I mean, online you can find so much information um, that you can um, where you can research. Which even um, talking about agency that that Bill was addressing, which even you may influence with your knowledge um, um, and with um, real information about the place, not just without with reading books, but by going to the place and um, um, add information to the knowledge of the world. I would just want also to mention an example of the. And um, Joanna was also mentioning in that people can bring in their own knowledge. Yeah, they they create part of the knowledge that is um, then afterwards co-designed, co-curated, <laughs> and co-created mm -hmm. um, in the and exposed um, or um, exhibited in the museums. But there is also um, the example of the Berlin Architectural Museum, which is linked to the TU Berlin in Germany. And what they, for example, also do is they they have of course. Um, an abundance of material um, from uh, from regions uh, which were Germany in the past and which are now part of Poland or um, White Russia or the, the Baltic uh, countries. But they have an open access database. So people from those countries can access the database and they can even reposition buildings so that they say, no, listen, this information in the database is wrong. In fact, the building is in that place. So there is already a kind of communication and dialogue. So my answer would be be active and, and um, try to use and profit from the tools and, and means that are already available. Thanks, Suvita. That's, that's wonderful. Anyone else on the panel who would like to make a short intervention? You have to unmute yourself if you want to say something. Well, if not, then we go to uh, another question, I think this is at um, the young Professor Ashim Asud. Uh, explain again about the formal and the informal city. That's the question. Can you be very brief, Ashima? Yes, absolutely. Uh, now, thank you for that question. You know, I'm trying to think about a visual representation of, uh, you know, what we are talking about what I mean by the formal and the informal. So one, um, you know, analogy that I gave is that the formal city is the intended city. It's the planned city. Uh, you know, it has the support of the state um, in many ways. Um, on the other hand, um, if you think of the informal city, then it's the unintended city. It's the city that was not part of the plan. Um, you know, I like the analogy of the garden. Right. And of course, uh, the garden city has been a really important paradigm in a lot of cities around the world. Um, and then you have the weed. Right. And that is, in fact, what uh, the informal city is. 
I do um, wanted to give you a little bit of a visual, uh, you know, suggestion. You know, how do you see this? Uh, there is actually a beautiful digital exhibition called uh, Landscape of Surprise. Uh, this is actually, um, you know, a study, a documentation of uh, the making of Hyderabad in Hyderabad, and it was done by the German urbanist uh, called Peter Gotch. And I recommend, I, I wish I had the opportunity here to show you some of these images, but you know, you go and look at some of those images and I think you will immediately understand. Could you post it in the chat box, the link? I will definitely do that. I will do that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you again for that question. Yeah. And then another question that comes about, uh, it, that's asked is how urbanism shapes the history of a particular area. I once again, there's so much online. If you go onto search engines and uh, look for placemaking, uh, you would get considerable amount of material on this. It's a wonderful question, but there's a lot in the public domain that you'll be able to access. And, um, and then, of course, then there's the question um, uh, whether urbanism fulfills uh, the all, demand of the, all the demands of the local people of the area very well, and then why the urban center is sometimes treated as the backdrop of urbanism. It's a, it's kind of a double-edged question, you know, so why are the urban centers, you know, becoming the backdrop of the process of urbanism? Uh, who wants to answer this? Hmm. Hello, Uta, <laughs> did we come to you? Um, well, um, uh, uh, there, I guess there might be multiple reasons for that. And uh, maybe let me again do a kind of a comparison um, with uh, 100 years uh, before, like uh, the, the beginning of modern movement as uh, not just to promote Dokumomo, I will put the link also in the, also in the, in the chat box later. Actually, the Indian chapter of Dokumomo was only founded in 2018. And so I really would like to, because I saw there are many uh, people from India uh, um, in, in, the, um, um, in, in the webinar. So we are still looking for members and we need young people um, who um, look for um, and document and observe um, these kind of um, 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 processes. And maybe that is also one of the answers um, to, um, uh, to your question, why are the centers so kind of neglected? Of course, it is uh, mainly, I would say, a, a kind of political decision. It is about uh, in increasing land prices. It's about a pressure that city centers have become very expensive all over the world with different maybe uh, levels of uh, and amount of, of, of money, which means that um, many practices, um, that many crafts, that many um, people um, had to leave the centers and, and, and only, let's say, global uh, companies or um, luxurious housing um, is able. And we see these tendency everywhere. Um, it might be, and that is a critique also to modernity. Um, it doesn't mean that being a member of Dokumomo means that everything is just positive, but it is an observation that, of course, um, modernity, and in particular the post World War II, so after 1950, modernity was mainly um, petroleum and car driven. So um, infrastructure actually led to a kind of um, separation of the functions, you know? I mean, people were working in one part and sleeping in another part of the city. And I think um, nowadays we are coming back to this idea of a more multifunctional uh, city of combining, of combining again, living and working um, and, uh, um, um, and uh, the, the leisure uh, spaces. Um, and uh, we are inclusive also in that sense that we are looking back on, on how city were before um, uh, motorization, individual mobility. Um, and I guess that was another reason of why the big shopping malls went outside, the residential areas went outside, the universities went outside the cities. Um, and now we are trying to get them all back yeah, um, I think this is a, a challenge. This is one part of the answer. Maybe there are more answers from yeah, the call. Thanks, Uta. Much appreciated. The question next one is to you, Joanna. Um, can museums support counter-narratives of itself? Counter-narratives as narratives 
that appear alongside or outside the museum's primary or dominant narrative? Joanna? Yes, uh, it's a very good question. So thank you for the question. And yes, absolutely, the museums can support counter narratives of um, themselves and should do it and are do it, doing it more and more. Um, and are, they are coming up from uh, the uh, grassroots research, from the practice um, field and also from the academy, of course. Uh, some topics like the decolonization and slavery being on the top of the museum's narrative and not just on the backstage or even, which is a lot worse, just invisible. And so we are, many of us, doing uh, some studies and some work about it. Uh, in our case, in the Museum of uh, Lisbon, the city of Lisbon, three years ago, we started along with other museums in uh, our country, in our city specifically, uh, a work, a project with scholars and museum professionals about um, pointing out and studying uh, testimonies on uh, slavery specific cases of slaves and what we as uh, colonial countries did exactly with figures and with human stories uh, without ex yes Amar. no no sorry no? Was... oh god sorry okay no, so um we start that but we didn't stop there we are going through on that path and we had uh, two, year, two years ago, actually, it was one year and a half, um, a, a big ex a temporary exhibition that was called Plural Lisbon about different communities that are living in the same city uh, with different um, religions and different uh, geographical backgrounds since the Middle Age and how uh, they kept until the 19th century. We will go again on that topic to address the contemporary ages, but about how they lived together uh, in peace and in war. So addressing both uh, could, issues. Could, and you pay, could you paste a link to that exhibition of course. in that box? Of and course. also to your museum because we're all coming to your museum. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. That, and and may I also, Amar, um, if you agree, pass the link to CAMOC website because uh, oh, absolutely. is absolutely. asking here how, how can she or he get in touch with ICOM community, community and learn more about oh, city museums? Absolutely. Okay, yeah. thank you. I'll That's do that. Great. And there is a question about intangible. I'll come to that. And uh, but first, is a question on how can museums serve layers of the age group, knowledge and socioeconomic development categories? Mario is socio-museology. I mean, this is what you do. So would you like yeah. to answer that, Mario? Yeah, yeah. maybe I can uh, have some idea about. I think with the Joanne that museum can, in, uh, in fact, uh, produce counter narrative and propose uh, different looks uh, different ways of understanding the things. But I think that uh, the, the, the main question is how can museums support to create a critical think in each person, a self-critical thinking? Uh, this is the question, because if we go on in uh, trying to support people to, 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 to demystify uh, what's coming every day, through newspapers, through television, through schools, through universities, through all these things, uh, and to try to understand for themselves what's going on. Then we can understand the other things. And we don't need that someone gives us a, a counter narrative. People will make their own counter narrative and they'll be able to understand what is going uh, on. I think we go back to Paul Freire every time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there are no, no other way. We must go back there and see that everybody has his uh, own knowledge uh, and that's uh, uh, in the dialogue that these things can uh, can. And what is the place of the museums that to make uh, uh, possible that people talk each one to other uh, and not only to stay in the position of, uh, which is a kind of colonial uh, thought, uh, just to hit what the others produced. Uh, 
Uh, I can understand those questions about uh, co-creation and cook or, or cook something. Uh, it's okay, uh, but in the point that our museums can uh, support this uh, uh, and bring people to think by their own selves. Uh, Thank you, Mario. Mario, next year is the hundredth birth anniversary of Paulo Freire. Next year. Next year. So <laughs> well, when, we, when we meet in Lisbon, uh, as part of the conference, would you be able to propose and organize a session on Paulo Freire, the centenary of Paulo Freire and the thinking thought process, which is just oh. so beautifully articulated. I'll get back to you on this because within the time I've got one more question that I can't. Sure. Uh, yeah, but sure, yeah. sure we can work on that idea. Fantastic. Well, that's yeah. good. It would be very nice. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, there's a question here, and I'd like to read it out because I love this question. I would like to underline that beyond the architecture and the urban landscape, as you mentioned, that we should learn again to look and observe at things, but, um, but what about the information that is no longer visible, a landscape even in the countryside host, at host culture and heritage. As an architect, I believe that we focus only on built Untangible heritage, but what about intangible that are mute and to be rediscovered? Part where the museum can help to disclose to the public. It's a wonderful question. Joanna and I are passionate, and so is uh, uh, all the panelists. In fact, passionate about you know revitalization of the multiple layers of heritage, both intangible and tangible, uh, within urban landscapes, whatever you want to call it, but whoever asked this question, because I can't tell, uh, is very important because today was our orientation. So I was addressing about 200 design and architecture students. My message to them was, please don't think of the, you know, the design finished product. It, it, it's not about an object. Please don't think about the building. Don't have an edifice complex. Think of the process. Design is about thinking. And if you lose the thinking, but when you think of thinking as the main goal, then you receive the past, you build on it based on the contemporary challenges, limitations, and possibilities, and you look forward to the future to, to make sure that design is, design is to improve life. So also architecture is to improve life. In India, architecture during the pandemic is a total disaster. Uh, it is a total disaster because all the places where people live are built based on measurements, based on how much space for each bedroom. Uh, the idea of a space where people could get outside, you know, is a little garden, a little gym exercise area, which doesn't work in the pandemic situation because of the physical distancing. And uh, so people have not been consulted in designing the architecture and the design of places in India, and I'm not sure uh, other countries are doing any better. Although I lived for four and a half years in Denmark, I think the Danes got it right in some ways because they, for them design is about improving life. So that's a wonderful question. And the question of intangible is critical to understand our sense of place and identity and what the spaces that we create. Um, uh, then uh, what's the difference between sociomuseology and ecomuseology? Mario, I leave it to you because we both have not much, right? Not much difference. Um, at uh, the end of the day, hmm? very quickly, uh, I think there are lots of ways of doing uh, museology concerned with the uh, issues of society. Eco museology is one of these ways, like native museology or critical museology or so. That's all different places, different periods in, uh, in uh, uh, give different answers uh, to the way people are doing museology. What we are trying to do with sociomuseology is to find inside social sciences a link between all these things so that we can understand it, that those uh, productions, we can say, in a holistic way. And it's not just because we would like to know everything about, but that's because we, maybe you can produce new tools and new reflections so that go back to the field and improve again 
eco museums, local museums, neighborhood museums, and all these things. So that, that's a, a, a little bit different. We try to find the, 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 the rationality of all these processes that are all over the world. And uh, now finally are recognized like in a, with uh, some, some institution like UNESCO. So uh, I, we believe that is uh, the right way. And we must think every time that museology is not different of the other social sciences. All the other public social science, it's okay. It's, and so, social museology is like all the other social sciences. Fantastic, Fantastic Mario, beautiful, very eloquently explained. I just want to add that over asked the question, having worked on four eco museums in four different countries in my lifetime, uh, the simple thing is eco museology is a methodology to bring people and their heritage together. It's as simple as that. It's not an edifice, it's not site-centered, but it's a process. It's a methodology to bring people and their heritage together. And uh, so, I think the we're almost out of time, we're out of time, but the last question is for Joanna. Um, Joanna, the question is, uh, in, 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 in many ways, what is called cultural quarters, museums play a vital role. Do you think establishing such quarters could benefit the city and the museum also? Joanna, I'm thinking about Fado, you know, the whole mm -hmm. neighborhood of Fado, Fado Museum, um, and Fado is intangible heritage on the UNESCO representative list, but it's also Fado Museum is a collection. Uh, would you like to answer this? Because Fado is a cultural quarter, which connects Lisbon with the rest of the world, but also with its own people. Yes, uh, it's it got to be a, a cultural quarter, but I'd like to go back to the question and answer sure. it depends. <laughs> because it can uh, be benefit the city and the museum also, or it cannot uh, benefit. I would say it depends a lot on whether it's grassroots or not, whether it's artificially done for tourism goals or not. Because if it, if it uh, concerns real culture, grassroots practices, like in the Father Cote you like, and you miss, I can tell. <laughs> You'll be there next year, hopefully. Um, it's of course very, very good because it's like a hub of knowledge, of sensitivity, and of culture being reactivated, reinterpreted, and created as new also. And that benefits the development of that quartier and the city as a whole, or at least the neighborhood, and also benefits the museum, um, which is about that theme, which is the case of the Father Museum, of course. And the museum also um, enhances the uh, cultural life of the quartier itself. So it's a win win connection, a win win relation when this can happen. But if a cultural courtier is created only to concentrate uh, consumers and tourists, it can, it can be very effective uh, for the consumers or the shops or both, but um, it does not necessarily mean that there is a lot of relevant knowledge or a relevant new cultural life coming from it. Thank you, Joanna, that's fantastic. I think that's something we all need to hear because tourism being you know, the major industry in the world, it's driving the so-called cultural quarters. In India too, I've come across you know, people using adaptive re reuse uh, and leading to gentrification of so-called cultural quarters in the context of tourism. And, and I think what you just raised there is something we have to think very critically. We're all looking forward to coming and visiting Lisbon uh, next year and uh, for a fantastic uh, inclusive museum, international conference and the inclusive museum. For all of you who are listening, this is a research network and we're meeting in Lisbon next year. Uh, in the uh, second week of September, you'll find it on the link that's been sent to you. And uh, we all welcome you. And we'll also keep in touch with you through this network. Our Common Ground Research Network has got all your contacts. You'll be hearing more about the conference. But in closing, I would really like to ask Professor Bill Cope to say a few words. Bill, over to you. 
Thank you very much, Amar. And look, thank you everyone for being here. Um, um, this is a, not just a great conversation that we've had, but also a great resource. You know, one of the accidental <laughs> consequences of us moving into this virtual world is we can instantly record something. You know, we can just <laughs> record it along the way. So thank you, not only to the people who are here in our virtual room today, but the people who are gonna be in uh, expanding time as well as space um, because this recording will, will last and the, you know, wherever it is, talk back to us and the conversation continues. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Professor Bill Cope. Thank you, everyone. And uh, please look at the links. Um, try to go on to the webpage on museums.com. Uh, you can sign up for the newsletter. It's free. Uh, there, there are a lot of free resources over there. So just your, you know, right now you don't have, you might find it daunting to think about next year when you're still in the pandemic, but there's nothing wrong in the digital domain, which you have such wonderful access to look at, you know, what, what is possible next year, you know, sort of, uh, um, thank you everybody. Wonderful, take care, be Hello. safe wherever you are. Ciao, adios, bye-bye. And when you exit, there'll be a, uh, I, I gather there'll be an evaluation form so that comes to you automatically. All right. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Mario. Thanks, Joanna. Bye. Thanks, Mashima. Thanks, um, Uta. You You've been wonderful. And uh, Bill, Professor Bill Cope. And uh, thank you, everybody. And also, Sharvari and uh, uh, Vishal Bai behind the scenes making it all happen. I'm so grateful to you. Bye for now.